Welcome to Palm Sunday. Yeah, it's all about, you know, this week as Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, just a few days later, he, he's on the cross. So he's on his way to the cross. So a great song to sing today, it's any day, every day, the wonderful cross. We're going to look at the cross today, actually. And so open your Bibles to, to uh, Galatians chapter 6. If you need a Bible, now's the time. We got Bibles. As I say, we're a church. Of course, we have Bibles. And you just uh, at, raise your hand if you need a Bible. It'd be great to look on uh, the passage, Galatians 6, and uh, some message notes. Does everyone have uh, some message notes? That would be helpful. And, uh, you know, congratulations. This is the last Sunday in our study through the book of Galatians. You guys, we've made it. Give, your, give yourselves a hand. I mean, it's, it's sad. It's kind of sad because Galatians is so rich. Uh, but it is, you know, we, this, we've come a long way. What is this, number 15 in the, the series of messages? And so I'm Pastor Scott. If you're new here, uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, we're going to jump into the, the scripture in just a minute and read through it. Um, but today's passage actually is all about boasting and uh, the right kind of boasting. And I, I started thinking about how our culture is really big on boasting. It seems like um, it's a major popular pastime in our day and age. Would you agree? Especially on social media. Have you noticed how much boasting goes on on social media pages? I mean, it's amazing. Um, it, because, because it's become so easy on social media, it seems like boasting has increased. I mean, people boast about what they, they're eating. Right? I mean, you've seen the pictures in the posts. They, they, they brag on their sports teams or, or their kids or their accomplishments or their favorite uh, pastime activities or favorite, uh, favorite sports teams and all. The, the list is endless. And uh, in fact, you might be interested, interested to know that back in 2017, a Nebraska company launched, and it's called Fake a Vacation. Have you heard about this? It's, it's, tr it's really amazing. They claim to bolster the social media pages of those who take on their services with expertly faked photos of vacations they never took. I'm not kidding. I went and I checked it out. 1999 will put you at the Grand Canyon. It goes all the way up to 49.99. You can go to Paris and some other nice places. They'll take your photos and superimpose them on expertly taken photos in front of landmarks at great locations for destina uh, destinations for uh, vacations. I'm not, and I'm not kidding you. And, it, uh, and their, their byline, their tag is, when you can't make a vacation, fake a vacation. <laughs> Anybody here ever take, take their services? Let's just be honest. Anyone ever? Okay. Some, uh, how many of you are interested now for 1999? Okay. I'll be looking for you. Well, in this passage, we're going to look at the fact that there's a kind of boasting that isn't bad and sad. I mean, because that's kind of bad and sad boasting, right? We'd all agree on that. And yet, Paul is actually going to talk about a boasting that's not just not bad and not just not sad, but actually encouraged and positive and something we should be all about. And so, um, it's basically, we come to this last passage in Galatians, it's his postscript, his PS. We get to look at Paul's PS. Throughout all his letters in the New Testament, he always has these final greetings, kind of his postscripts. When he gets done with the basic bulk and body of the letter he's writing, he says, kind of like P.S., here's, I uh, say hi to so-and-so, and, you know, I, I want to bless you, and I want to uh, bless them, and he'll go into, you know, those kind of things, uh, such as, uh, uh, you know, just personal words of thanks and appreciation. But in Galatians, we're going to see there's no personal greetings. Not at all. In fact, when he signs off his letters, he usually has a secretary, or someone writing his letters for him. He's dictating them. And then sometimes you'll see in the, the, the letters he writes in the New Testament, he says, now I'm writing this at the very end of the letter with my own hand. Like he takes the pen from the secretary and he's with his own, sig it's not like his signature on the, on, the, on the letter. Here is my own hand. He doesn't do that all the time. But here he does. And notice what he says. I mean, we're going to see that he signs off in a really interesting way. So instead of personal greetings, what does he do instead in this postscript? He reiterates his main theme for the entire letter. 
He wants them to know what he wants them to know so badly that he can't help but remind them once again of the major theme of his letter to them as Galatians, right? And we're going to see that as we make our way through the text. And so he restates the main theme of his letter. Let's start. Chapter 6, verse 11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Now, for some reason, he's writing in large letters. Some scholars believe it was because he couldn't help but write in large letters because he had an eye ailment, right? He couldn't see that well. Some believe his motor skills had been impaired from all the beatings he took because of the gospel, right? He was persecuted and beat, beaten and shipwrecked, and maybe he couldn't write very clearly anymore, so he has to write big letters. Some believe he's writing big letters kind of like we use big fonts and underscored and bold, italicized print. In other words, like, important stuff coming. Pay attention. And it could very well be any or all three of those things. But I, I do think it's, he's intentionally saying, this is what I told you, I'm going to tell you again one last time, because it's too important for you to ignore or forget. And so, notice he says this, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh. Now, who's he talking about again? What's the whole letter about in Galatians about? The false teachers, right? The, the teachers of the law, the Judaizers. So he's going back to them. He's saying, he's saying, listen, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh. If you got your Bibles and you circle and underline stuff, you might want to circle means of the flesh. That's his way throughout the book of Galatians and throughout all his letters. He talks about the natural person, the natural man, the natural spirit, the, uh, the carnal man right? Man versus God. Natural versus supernatural. So that's what he's talking about. He goes, those who are working in the flesh, according to the world system, according to, you know, works righteousness. He says, those people are trying to what? Compel you to be circumcised. He's talked about that throughout the letter. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised. Those guys telling these other people to be circumcised, they don't even keep the law themselves. Yet they want you to be circumcised. Why? What's, what's he go, to, go on to say? That they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. And then he says this. So there's, that's the wrong kind of boasting, right? Then he turns the tables and he says, May I never boast except in one thing. Except in what? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. To the Israel of God, from now on, let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. If you want a list of all the bodily marks he received because of the gospel, check out 2 Corinthians 11 sometimes. He goes on and on about all the different things he suffered. It's quite an impressive list. He says, hey, I, you guys are doing this mark of the circumcision. and They want to do it in the bodies of the people. I've got the marks of Jesus on my body. So listen to what I'm saying. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Let's pray. Father, we want to understand what Paul's boast is all about, what we can be boasting in today. Father, thank you for the wonderful cross. May we understand it even better today because of the time we spend in your word. May it change us and transform us and help us to live lives that would glorify you. We pray it all for the sake of Jesus. Amen. And so today, we're going to look at some of the most practical, helpful, useful truths that can help us live a life that glorifies God, that helps us live a life, the life we've been designed and called to live. So you might go, okay, we're going to talk about the cross. Yeah, we're going to talk, talk about the cross. But don't check out. Don't say, oh, I know about the cross because we don't know about the cross. We know about the cross maybe this much. If we know anything, we know about this much. A lot of people don't even understand the cross. But you're a follower of Jesus. You know about the cross. And yet we can always go deeper in the cross. So that's what I hope and, hope and pray we'll do today as we dig into this passage. So did you catch the boast of Paul? You might want to circle it, underline it, verse 14. Did you catch it? It's, it's the pinnacle. You're taking notes, write this down. 
pinnacle of Galatians is verse 14, I believe. Many others believe it too. It's maybe even one of the pinnacles of the entire New Testament or the entire Bible, right? And he says, this is what I live for. This is what I exalt in. This is what I, I'm obsessed with. This is what drives me. It's the cross. It's the cross. He says there's only one, and that word boasts there. He says, may I never, may I never, other translations say, far be it from me. Maybe that's what your translation says. Another translation says, God forbid. Man, those are strong terms, aren't they? May I, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. One thing is necessary. One thing I need to boast in, and it alone is the thing I boast in. It alone is the one thing I boast in. The cross. Why? We're going to get into that. It's a great question. But that word boast means to glory in or exult in or be consumed by or be obsessed with. That's what he's saying. I'm obsessed with the cross. He's cross crazy. <laughs> right? That's what we'd say. He's crazy about this. What? What is Paul crazy about? The cross. He's crazy about it. Why? You're going, why? What's so big about the cross? I'm glad you asked. We're going to get into that. By the way, we see this obsession with the cross throughout the whole letter of the Galatians. Go through the, the book of Galatians when you have time and circle every time the word cross or crucifixion or crucify appears. It, it's throughout the book. In fact, it's throughout many of the Gospels. In fact, here's what's interesting. John writes a Gospel, 21 chapters long. John the Apostle. And here's what, what we find out. Verse, uh, chapters 1 through 11, you know what John talks about for ver chapters 1 through 11? It's all about Jesus' life and ministry. What does he get into in chapters 12 through 21? I mean, half of the book is about the last week of Jesus' life. And most of those chapters are about the final hours before the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Um, Gospel of Mark, the same way. You have 13 chapters, all taking snapshots of Jesus' life and ministry. And then chapters 14 and 15 come along, and Mark slows way, way down and slows the, slows the train and says, we got to really look at the final hours of Jesus' life. Why? Because it's the most important thing in the universe, what happened on the cross. Today we're going to look at two basic things in this text before us. That's what keeps us from boasting. What keeps people from boasting in the cross? And then we're going to look at why we're able to be obsessed by it and be boastful about it, okay? So we're going to look at what keeps people from boasting in the cross and then why we're able to boast in the cross. And we're going to understand that a lot of times we don't boast in the cross because we don't understand and appreciate the cross. And my prayer is that today we'll have a fresh appreciation for the cross of Jesus. In fact, just this week, in our life group, um, a couple of different people in our life group spoke up. And they, this wasn't about the sermon today, but they just said, you know what? I went to church my whole life. I really never understood. I never really heard about the cross. And it kind of floored me. It's like, what? And they said, yeah. And I started thinking. They said, no, we, we heard about the cross. We never were really taught about the cross or understood the cross. And I'm thinking, what a tragedy to be in a church. And I, that's what I want to make sure doesn't happen in our church is that people walk away and don't understand the cross, at least somewhat. And so wherever, you're, wherever we are, wherever you are in, the, in your understanding of the cross today, I hope and pray it gets a little deeper for all of us because we can never exhaust the cross. And so let's jump in. So what keeps people from boasting in the cross? What keeps people from boasting in the cross? Well, several things. First of all, on your outline, it, it brings persecution. And that's what Paul's talking about here, right? He's saying the, the false teachers don't want to emphasize the cross. They don't like the cross because they don't want to be persecuted of, because of the cross. Uh, look at verse 12. The false teachers of the law were pressuring these people to be circumcised. Why? Because they're saying Jesus is good, but Jesus is not what? Sufficient. Jesus is not enough. You've got to have Jesus, yeah, but you've got to really come through and uh, and perform and do all these kind of things like circumcision and follow the Old Testament law so that God will really be okay with you. Because Jesus isn't enough. The cross isn't enough. And uh, he says they do it. Why? Look at verse 12. They do it because they're afraid of being persecuted 
because of the cross. Because Paul is saying if you embrace the cross, like I'm telling you to embrace the cross, um, hold on a second. That's the wrong one. He's saying if you embrace the cross like I'm talking about, you're going to be persecuted. Right? Write this down on your notes somewhere if you're taking notes. Expect persecution. Expect it. Philippians 1, Paul says there, it has been granted to you. Doesn't that sound exciting? I've been granted what? I've, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ to suffer. I love the way he puts that. Because it's like, oh, I've been granted what? Oh, to suffer. Yeah, expect it. We're identifying with a Messiah who's been mocked, beaten, scourged, spat upon, and finally nailed to a cross. What else should we expect if that's our leader? Right? Stephen, at the hands of Paul, was the first Christian martyr, someone who died for their faith in Jesus and his work on the cross. And then Paul, who's there at the stoning of Stephen, approving of it, later on, he gets a taste of his own medicine, right? Uh, well, he gets mouthfuls of his own medicine, right? Check out the beatings I've received on my body, he says. 2 Timothy says this, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus. How many of you, by the way, don't raise your hand, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but if you could say yes, raise your arm in your heart, I want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, okay? That's hopefully many of us, if not most of us. All who desire to live godly lives in Jesus will be, wait for it, blessed. He doesn't say that. We are, but he says there, will be persecuted. All means what in the Greek? <laughs> I'm throwing, it means everyone. It's a, no, you don't need to know Greek to know all means every one of us. If we're trying to live like Jesus, we will be persecuted. You say, well, I, haven't been, 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 I haven't been persecuted. Have you been, if we're not being persecuted, it might be that we're not living godly lives in Christ Jesus. Just saying. Some we can all grow in. So who says God won't continue to allow his followers to suffer in the world? Jesus said this, in this world you can expect what? Trouble, tribulation. And then um, the cross brings persecution. And so many people say, no thank you. Besides that, notice, many don't boast in the cross because of this. It isn't seen as important. That's what we've been talking about. My hope and prayer for all of us in this church today is that we'll leave this place when we're, we're done with our service a little more appreciative, a little more understanding, a little more in love with and obsessed by the cross of Jesus. Because we don't, we, we don't boast in it because we don't understand it as the most important thing Ever. The first man and woman in the garden in Genesis 3. What, ha what happened in the garden? Think about it. How many sins did they commit for death to enter the world? How many sins did they commit to devastate creation and ruin humanity? How many sins did it take for God to exercise his righteous, holy, and good opposition to evil by judging it as evil? One, just one, one, sin is serious to God, he hates it, he opposes it, he judges it, if just, now here, this is, this is even more mind boggling, if one sin could do that, Jesus on the cross received how many sins placed upon him? <laughs> all sins of all time. Every sin anyone ever committed, past, present, and future, was laid on him on the cross. See, we need to understand the only way to deal with our sin and make us right with him was that judgment was placed on him that was meant for us. The judgment that we deserved was placed on him. And it makes that the most important thing we, I can think of. It's a big deal. It's the biggest deal. 
We need to understand that. The only way to deal with our sins is Jesus took them on the cross. And so the main thing about Jesus isn't that he's a great moral teacher. How many of you are thankful for his moral teachings? His teaching, yeah. Amen. That's not the greatest thing about Jesus, though. Right? Because the Old Testament taught us to love our neighbor as ourselves, Le- Leviticus chapter 19. I mean, Jesus came and he taught, and he, he taught better than anyone. He taught us the most important things, yet that's not the most important thing Jesus was about when he came to earth. Uh, it wasn't his healing powers. It wasn't his miracle working. As great as those things are, that's not the most important thing about Jesus when he comes to earth. It's not the things Jesus said that's most important. It's what he did. Right? Jesus said this, I came to earth to seek and to save the lost. And we know the context of that saving was on the cross because Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, the son of man has come to give his life as a ransom for who? For many. Do <laughs> you see how integral the cross is? It's so much, so much of what we are, we're about is about the cross. We need to be cross crazy. <laughs> so remember, if you embrace the cross like Paul's talking about here, there's a cost. It's suffering and persecution. Why? Well, that leads us to another reason many don't boast on the cross. Notice the cross, and probably the most important reason, the cross offends. That's what he's talking about here. Throughout Galatians, he talks about, am I in trouble? Because, I mean, the offense of the cross. He uses that phrase throughout the book of Galatians and throughout the New Testament. The offense of the cross. The cross is offensive. Why? Well, what is, how many, most of us, we've been in church, we know about the horrible, tragic torture of crucifixion, right? I mean, we know that the Romans devised it as the most humiliating and painful way to die. In fact, if you were in Rome and you were a Roman in that day, you would not say crucifixion or cross in the presence of polite company. That's what historians tell us. It was so horrific. In fact, if you were a Roman, you could not be executed by crucifixion because it was designed to humiliate and devastate and denigrate the enemies of Rome. It wasn't meant for Rome. It was for all their enemies. And so what you have here is Paul saying, I glory in the cross. I exult in the cross. And, uh, and that's offensive. So offensive. Because how, how many of you, we have a cross right here, right? Today, you can walk into many homes that don't even know Jesus. And there's crosses on the, on the walls for decorations. Some, many people are wear crosses around their necks. And they don't even know what it's about. It's like the girl, I, I read about this, this girl, this jeweler was saying, this girl, this young woman came into the, the, the jewelry shop and was looking at crosses in their display case. And she said, can I look at that one? I got to look at that one. And she goes, oh, can I see that one with the little man on it? <laughs> I'm just saying. They, we don't appreciate it. We, we have come to make the cross a bit of jewelry or something to decorate the walls of our home. And yet that's not what, what it was for Paul. It wasn't what it was for Jesus. It'd be like you wearing a little electric chair around your neck. People would go, what are you doing? Little needle, lethal injection. You know, ways of execution. A hangman's noose. What's that? Oh, that's weird. That's bad. That's what the cross meant, and that's what it still means. Death. It's an instrument of death. And that's offensive. Because here's what the cross says. Write this down. The cross reminds us of how bad we are. That it took Jesus on an instrument like that to bring us back to God. Nothing short of that would do. And so the false teachers in Galatia uh, are stumbling over the offense of the cross. Now, the cross is offensive for a couple of reasons. Let's write this down. First of all, the cross for some people is offensive because it's, 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 it, it is exclusive. It is exclusive. The message of Jesus is an exclusive message. And if you're a relativist, if you're someone who says everyone should be able to choose his or, own, her, his or her own pathway to God, and God should accept that, and therefore I don't want to be forced into one way to come to God, you're a relativist. And you're offended by the cross because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Right? And 
uh, Peter goes on to say, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by what, which we must be saved. Very exclusive. The cross is exclusive in that way. And people are offended by that because they want to choose their own way and think God should just accept that, right? Others, like the Judaizers here in the book of Galatians, they're offended by the inclusiveness of the cross. That's why they, they say the cross is not enough. We've got to add to it and make it harder to be right with God. We, the cross itself isn't enough for us to be right with God. We have to add some things we've got to do. Therefore, we can stand back and say, look what we've done. Look how we're accomplishing. God, you must accept me, not just because of Jesus, but because of all the good things I'm adding to him. And so the cross levels the playing field. The, they, they say... The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And there's a lot of people, religious types, that don't want to think they can be right with God the same way a drunkard could be right with God. They, they don't like, they like the thought that uh, they, as good as they think they are, are on the, same par, on the same par with the prostitute. But they are. You know who the greatest sinner is? You and me. The greatest sinner to me is me. You know why? I know my sins better than anyone else does. Because they're deep inside of me, some, some of them are. We're all messed up. And we need the cross. And so, John Stott says this. Every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to say to us, I'm here because of you. Look at the cross. Can you picture Jesus saying, I'm here on the cross because of you? It's your sin I'm bearing, your curse I'm suffering, your debt I'm paying, your death I'm dying. Nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, especially in self-righteousness, until we have visited a place called Calvary. It is there at the foot of the cross where we shrink to our true size. That's good. See, the cross has a bitter shell. It's offensive. And because of it, we're confronted with our weakness and our wickedness. We're confronted with the depths of our sin and our inability to make ourselves right with God on our own. Theologian Roger Nicole, for many years uh, a professor at Gordon-Conwell University, he taught many pastors that you probably know of in the world today. I mean, very, very influential, good teachers sat under his teaching. One of them is, was Timothy Keller, Tim Keller, and you, you'll hear him quote a lot. Uh, we, he, he has so many great insights. Um, he tells a story that he heard uh, Nicole give, and I want to share it with you. Basically, the story goes like this. Say you're, at, you're outside your house because you're all watching your house burn. Your family is watching your house burn down. And you're safely outside the house. All your valuables that you really need to make sure are out of the house are out. All your kids and family are outside the house. And they're watch you're just watching your house burn down. And then your neighbor runs up to you and says, watch how much I love you. And runs into the burning house and dies. You think, that is idiotic. No, he knows we're all safe and sound. But he goes, I'm going to show you how much I love you. You'd go, that's, stu that is, that's lame, that's stupid. Right? But he says, he, but the illustration goes, now imagine, your house is burning, but not all the valuables you've recovered. In fact, you've got all your kids out but one. You're not able to get the last one out, and it's getting so bad. And your neighbor runs up to you then and says, watch how much I love you. Runs in, saves your kid, brings your, kids, your kid out, puts your kid safely in your arms, and then he expires. Your neighbor falls down dead. Whole different story, right? Whole different, you feel a lot different about your neighbor than that, Right? And so the point is this, if there was any other way for Jesus, for God to bring us back to, to himself, besides the death of his son on the cross, Jesus' death on the cross is just as lame as that neighbor running in and saying, look how much I love you. He died for no purpose, right? Thought, Man, that's, that's so good. It's so true. If anything short of the death of Jesus was enough to get us back to God, would God have ever sent his son? Jesus' death makes no sense unless it's our only hope. And so let's consider now, why should we boast in the cross? Those are reasons we don't boast in the cross. We don't understand it. We don't appreciate it. We're afraid of persecution. It's not that important to us. It's offensive. 
But why should we boast in the cross? Look at verses 14 through 16. Well, first of all, verses 15 and 16, he says this, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. What counts, he says, what matters? The new creation, you might want to circle that. It's not these outward things. It's like what's going on inside you, the change God has made in your real life, your spiritual life, who you really are, the new, the new you, right, the new, the new Scott, right? It's, it's what he's doing in you. See, we don't need just to turn over a new leaf, folks. No, <laughs> we need a whole new life because our need is not partial. Our need is total. And so a new creation powered by the Holy Spirit. Check out the last part of Galatians 5, right? We looked at that in depth. If, you, if you're new to this series, you might want to check out those messages. The last half of Galatians 5 is all about life in the Spirit. So notice, new life, new creation, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it produces something. Notice what the text says. It produces, look at those words, peace and mercy. That peace and mercy, folks, is conditional, right? It's not like, oh, God just gives peace and mercy to anyone. It's those who embrace the cross, those who live by the Spirit, they get to experience peace and mercy. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. And notice this, is lived out in, in the new community. He says the Israel of God. Isn't it, why does he put that in there? Well, throughout the New Testament, we see that God is about making one new man, one new community. And Paul talks about this earlier in Galatians, right? In Galatians chapter 3. Check it out if you have your Bibles open. Check, check, check out Galatians 3, 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all the people of God, right? The sons of God. The family members of God's household through faith. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Here there is neither, what? Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. What nation is Abraham's offspring? Israel, Jews. If you are Christ's, you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter calls the church the, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And those words are paralleling the kinds of description that in Exodus 19 you'll find of Israel when God is entering covenant with them. There's really a cool tie-in between these, the Old and the New Testament when it comes to this idea of who are God's people. And then in uh, James 1, James chapter 1, he calls the church the 12 tribes scattered abroad. We're all in Christ the people of God, the new community that experience a new life, live by the Spirit, obsessed with the cross. So the irony, the cross leads to life. Don't I love the song we sang just a moment ago before the sermon started. Bid the wonderful cross, the wondrous cross, right? Bids us to come and die and find that we may truly live. That's the message of the cross. Paul says it like this back in Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Where did he give himself for us? <laughs> On the cross. Are you getting cross crazy yet? I hope so. The, the, the cross also, notice this on your outline, gives new perspective on everything. The cross will change the way you look at your life, the way you look at the world, the way you look at anybody else in your life. So what's the crossless? The crossless, the, 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 this, the perspective that is void of the cross, what's that perspective? That's the, the perspective of the false teachers here in Galatia. They don't want to be persecuted. Why? They had a need to be accepted, liked by others, to build themselves up, to feel better about themselves so they can say to God, look how good we are. And they want to show themselves as better than other people. Because again, if they could get the Gentiles to get circumcised and do all the outward trappings of the Old Testament rules and regulations, they could boast about themselves, right? They could say, look at all these Gentile converts we convinced to be circumcised. Look how good we are. 
and show off their good works and thereby increase their right standing before God. But ta- Paul doesn't talk about that perspective. He talks about a cry- Christ-shaped, cross-shaped perspective. Look at chapter, again, chapter 6, verse 14. The cross by which I've been what? I've been crucified to the world. He puts himself on the cross after Jesus. Because Jesus was, for our sake, being crucified. So Paul says, man, I was crucified along with him on the cross. To the what? To the world. What's that mean? Does he not live in the world anymore? No, he lives in the world. But to the, the how, how many of you would love the world to be crucified? I mean, you're, you're sick and tired of being tempted and falling. And wouldn't it be great if God just killed the world off? And let his eternal kingdom come. That's, Paul's not saying that. Notice what he says. I've been crucified to the world. It's not the world's been. As far as I'm concerned. I'm, the world is dead to me. And I'm dead to the world. That's the perspective. That he's talking about. Us adopting for ourselves. It's the world system. John Stott again says. Previously we were desperately anxious. To be in favor with the world. But now in Christ. We have seen ourselves as sinners and Christ crucified as our sin bearer. We don't care what the world thinks or says of us or does to us. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In other words, write this down. The world no longer has any claim on you if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're committed to Christ, the world, you don't have to think like the world thinks anymore. You don't have to live like the world lives anymore. You are free to live as a new creation. You are free to walk by the Spirit. You are now, the, the, was it the shackles are gone? What was the song we sang? I've been set free. We just did that, right? The wonder, I've, was that the, today we did that song? Yeah, my shackles aren't rise. My shackles are no more. That's the new creation, the new life. He's talking about the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. See, We don't live for the world's satisfaction. We don't try to get joy from the world. Our joy is found in who now? In Jesus. He is the world to us. See, that's what the perspective of the Christian is. A whole new perspective. Paul's going, I'm dead of the world. I'm alive to Christ. We don't need the approval of the world anymore because we have the approval now of the only one who really matters. Paul refused to obsess about or live for anything other than the truth of the cross. Because of Christ's work on the cross, he had the approval of God. And so this gets really, really practical. Some of you are saying, oh, finally, something practical. Yes, the whole thing's practical. But let's, let's get it really down to grassroots. If you're anxious this morning, if you're, if you're kind of stressed out this morning, ask yourself, why, am I feel so, why do I feel so stressed? Why am I so anxious? What am I worried about? What am I worried about? You're worried? Why are you worried? Most likely, it's because you're not focusing on the cross of Jesus. Most often, and we all do this, we get our eyes off the cross and onto our circumstances. And our circumstances will keep us up at night. I guarantee you that. And yet Paul's going, you know what? I'm not going to boast in any of those things. I'm not looking to those things as my ultimate sense or source of security and joy and satisfaction. I'm looking to the cross. And let me just say, anytime you start feeling stressed or anxious, look to the cross. Don't glance at the cross. Look at the cross. I think you were saying, we got to focus today on the cross. I mean, we got to focus on God and what he's done for us in the cross. If God be for you, who can be against you? And where do we see most clearly God being for us? What's it? Yeah, good class. It's cross. It's the cross. It's It's almost always the cross. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. So, your base of identity should be founded and rooted in the cross. Be captivated by his love displayed on the cross. Be mastered by that one great moment when the Savior of the world was nailed to the cross for you. And then what happens? We're freed up to enjoy every good and perfect gift that is only from the Father, from the Father above. James chapter 1 says, God gives us all these things to enjoy. See, until you have the cross perspective, all these other things will sidetrack you from the cross. But once you have that perspective, you can take all those things in with the right perspective and the right moderation. And that's the last thing. Notice this. The cross, therefore, is the conduit for all that's good in your life. 
Every blessing, I'll turn back to praise, right? We sing that sometimes. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Every blessing you have comes through the cross, right? Every blessing we, re, we, we enjoy comes through the cross. We tend to think God owes us or does, we deserve certain things from God. God doesn't owe us anything but death and destruction. That's what God owes us. But every good thing for us was obtained only by the cross so that now we can re- experience God's peace and mercy as he talks about here in this chapter. Because without the cross, who are we? Without the cross, we are sinners standing before a holy God deserving judgment without the cross. The cross is the channel of all that's good because Jesus took our wrath upon himself. Now we have the promises, right? We have the promises of God that all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, Romans chapter 8. We have that. But it comes via through the cross and his sacrifice and us entering into relationship with him that he now blesses us. So every breath we take, every time our heart beats, every day the sun rises, every day we get to see with our eyes or hear with our ears or walk with our legs is a free and undeserved gift to sinners who only deserve judgment but now don't have to undergo judgment because of the cross. It all ties together. Paul's only boast was in the cross. What's your boast this morning as we move into a time of communion, a time of decision? Maybe you're here today and you need Jesus, and you're going, wow, you know, I didn't realize the cross has so much in it. And maybe God's moving in your heart as we've been praying that God would move in all our hearts today. Maybe your decision today is I need to, I need to accept God's gift of grace and what he did for me on the cross. And you, you could do that right where you are. You could say, Jesus, as much as I know how, I accept what you did for me on the cross. You love me that much? You ran into the burning house and saved me and then you, you, and you died f- to save me? Oh, I'm all yours. I'm all in. If that's your decision, you could just tell that to God right now and let other people know about that. The Bible says, if, Jesus says, if you confess me before others, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. We'd love to come alongside you and know about that decision and help you grow and take steps uh, in this new life that he's given you as his new creation but the, for the rest of us who know Jesus this is what communion is all about it's looking to the cross right we look to the cross the wonderful cross here's why the cross is so wonderful it's God's love and God's judgment coming together that's what happens at the cross God's judgment against sin and his love for us sinners comes together on the cross That's why it's wonderful. That's why we don't just look at the cross. We have to gaze at the cross. We have to drink in the cross. And that's what we get to do every Sunday. Every time we come around the Lord's table, we should be drinking in the cross. And isn't it so cool? Jesus never once said, I want you to remember my birth. No specific place to say, celebrate Christmas. How many of you celebrate Christmas? How many of you love Christmas? Just interesting. He never says celebrate Christmas. He does say celebrate the cross. Celebrate my death on the cross. And then his resurrection is coming this Sunday, a week from today. But before that, it's Good Friday. The cross, it's always, it's always hinged on the cross. And so if Jesus, we love you. We want to know you more. We want to fall in love with your cross. We want to become, want to become cross crazy people more and more. Because, Father, it is the answer to every challenge, every temptation, every discouragement. We just look to Jesus and him on the cross, and we never plummet's depth. Help us to plummet just a little more, even now, as we come to you. Thank you for your death on the cross, your body given, your blood shed on the cross. And may those who don't know you today, wherever they may be, they may be watching online, they may be here in this room. Whoever doesn't know you today, Father, draw them one step closer to you. May they embrace you and what you did for them on the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.